Henry David Thoreau once wrote, which is the question is not what you look at, but how you look and whether you see. And how someone sees and how they convey that through the, the elements of paint, which is what I'll be focusing on today, the elements of paint uh, to be expressive is very much at the heart of modernist sense of place because it allowed for the self, the individual self, the subjective self, to bond with a space and making it then a place that one has associations with. One thing that is crucial to modernist thought is indeed modernist painting in particular is this idea of the importance of the medium of the paint itself, or of the etching plane, or of the graphite pencil, or of, if you're working in sculpture, uh, its various uh, elements, uh, such as wood, or plaster, or bronze. And these artists that we'll be looking at today, uh, and that we see uh, in Innes, very much identified with both not only what they were painting, but how they were painting. Uh, that the, the, it was through the medium of the art that they were then able to really bring some of themselves into uh, the space that they were looking at and turn it into a place that was a reflection of themselves. So that what we're going to see is that, that this topophilia is a bond of the artist with the environment that he or she uh, puts their sights on, that they not only look, but they really see, and how they see gives us a meaning. In particular, we could, uh, to get a better sense of this, we could uh, contrast the landscape of Frederick Edwin Church's Otter Creek, a real place, been there, go there every um, August uh, in Maine, and the, then this other place that Innes does. Now Innes painted a lot of areas that were around his home in Montclair, New Jersey, and that is very much probably what this uh, particular place is. And uh, what he is giving us is kind of a pastoral image, but you can see right away, and then of course with the details, that there couldn't be anything more different and then their application of paint and the way they delineate specifics of nature. So Church gives us every little rock. He gives us the detailing of the figure, interesting enough, in red, white, and blue. I think that's very purposeful. He is making this a national, Ameri he's putting a kind of American flag in the middle of this landscape that will be, in fact, protected from development thanks to his paintings and his teachers, Thomas Coles. And uh, he also gives us uh, the geology of the rocks, etc. cetera. Whereas you can see in Innes's painting, Light Triumphant, of uh, perhaps 1862, though it looks much more like his later uh, style, we have a figure that at first you may barely see, who merges visually because this figure also merges with the paint itself, uh, that there is very little distinction between the ground and the figure, except for this wonderful red and white that allows it to pop out a little bit. Uh, even if we contrast the detailing of the background here and the trees versus a church who was well versed in the geology and botany of the day, studying under the great uh, scientists uh, in terms of reading him, uh, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, that he gives us this very physical material world. That does not mean, however, it is not filled with meaning, as I've already suggested, uh, with not only this figure in a flag-like uh, dress, but if we look carefully, you can see he's holding the mast. He's looking up to this great part of Cadillac Mountain, the highest mountain in Mount Desert. And if you look carefully, his shadow gives us a cross. Church, who was a Scottish Presbyterian, is literally blessing the landscape here as, as it 
uh, was very much what Americans were really seeing, American landscape as part of its manifest destiny and a gift from God. So he is really literally giving us this blessing. Ennis does not give us these overt iconographic symbols. Instead, he gives us a feeling, a mood, a poetry. And this is exactly what the critics of the day praised as they started to criticize, particularly by the 1880s, the more what they used the term niggling detail of the Hudson River School. So that Innes really is this kind of modernist vision. We know for Innes uh, that it was important that uh, the process, he would completely redo his paintings over and over. He would use his fingers to uh, put paint on the canvas. Uh, he also made equations between his paintings and music, something that modernist artists would continue to do well into the 20th century and maybe even today in the 21st century. Uh, Innes, who was a very spiritual person, just as uh, Church was a religious individual, uh, saw correspondences between nature and humanity everywhere he looked and uh, was following the tenets of Swedenborgianism by doing that, a kind of um, earlier influence on our American transcendentalist thought. And uh, Church, however, gives us precise symbols, another one being this mountain. Uh, Cadillac Mountain was, in fact, associated with a burial mound for surveyors and was called Adam's Grave. It also has been altered according to Pam Berlinger, and I think she's right having seen Cadillac Mountain. It doesn't really look like this. If you start looking, and this is something his teacher Thomas Cole did, Church has turned this, and again, you're going to have to use a little anthropomorphism here. Here's an eye, here's the nose, here's the gaping mouth, has turned it into a face that's looking up to God, something that a church would do in other works of art, along with our hidden cross that he gives us in the shadows. We have none of that in Innes. Innes, in fact, was very much against the idea that art should give us a moral lesson or that art should instruct or edify, which was the foundation of church and earlier uh, artists' work in the 19th century. Innes said that the purpose of art was to awaken an emotion, uh, to be truth to the poetry of paint. And even as their art uh, developed and uh, these two uh, individuals continued to live through the end of the 19th century, church uh, painting all the way until uh, about the end of his life, which was around 1900. Here we have a work from 1881. We can see, still see church holding to detail. Uh, here's his trees versus the wonderful abstraction probably also influenced a little bit by Japanese prints, of George Innes's great home of the heron, a painting that is in the great Chicago Institute of Art, a painting of 1893, in which we have just merely indications, uh, just wisps of trees versus the detailing. And even the figure here, of course, is quite uh, visible and uh, very detailed versus the heron, which almost seems as if it's in motion, as if it's an afterthought, or more likely is, again, a spirit bird, uh, really suggesting another plane of existence, which Innes was very interested in suggesting. And so, too, would his fellow and following modernist artists in his work. Innes uh, said that the true in use of art is to cultivate the arts, artist's own spiritual nature. And then every artist who, without reference to external circumstances, aims truly to represent the ideas and emotions which come to him when he is in the presence of nature. And that is part, as he would say, of his own spiritual development. So again, there is this almost sensate and also um, transcendental and metaphysical relationship with the landscape and with the process of painting. 
Now I mentioned that there is a musical nature to Ennis's art, and I want you to notice how we could read this as a rhythm across the canvas, whereas Church leads us into the distance. He wants it to be a window for us to enter. And in fact, he would do frames that looked like windows uh, that had opened, even with velour on them, with uh, velvet curtains. And uh, he would also give us botanical specimens so that we could compare and see how good he is as a painter. Innes, of course, isn't concerned that. He wants you to feel. And he also wants you to, in a sense, get into the rhythm, the musical tonality of the work. He wrote to his son George, who was also a painter, now we will put a dab of dark here and light over there. We thump, thump, thump the keys to the distance. But don't forget to put in the harsh note, the accidental. It makes the contrast that gives interest and variety to the whole, the gradation of light and shade, which corresponds to music. And of course, it is Whistler, who even before Ennis, uh, would do this, naming his paintings symphonies and harmonies and nocturnes. Now, as several works in the current exhibition demonstrate, for American modernists of the late 19th and early 20th century, there was another space besides the pastoral or wilderness space of, the, of what we've seen in Ennis and Church and Lewis that was important. And in fact, Lewis hints at it in his Palisades image. And that is New York City. New York City was a space that became a place for modernist American artists. Very much worth capturing because it was the new New York and it became the symbol of the American 20th century. It was, of course, with its increasingly towering buildings and full of teeming populace that was very diverse with the many immigrants coming in. It was also the largest city in America and the second largest in the world. London was the first. By 1900, there were, now this seems very little, uh, 3.5 million people uh, in 1900, and uh, the United States had almost 76 million by that date, and of course it rapidly increased. And New York was seen as unrepentantly modern with its skyscrapers, the largest in the world, the Flatiron Building in 1902, of course to be followed by many others competing. And it was modern in its sense of freedom, in its sense of fluidity, in its sense of ambition, in its daringness and willingness to reject tradition, to get rid of those brownstones, uh, to put up neon lights of Broadway, and to embrace new forms, new materials, new architecture, to be what Walt Whitman had foreseen in the 19th century as Manhattan the sun, as him saying, I am uh, cosmos, I am the energy of Manhattan, and really celebrating it. All the modern artists, by the way, love Walt Whitman. He was their inspiration. Now, these three artists we have here, George Bellows, Edward Hopper, and John Marin, were, of course, great interpreters of the place that was New York City. But what interests me is how they also found inspiration in nature. The nature, in fact, that inspired Frederick Edwin Church to be one of the first to paint that place in the 1850s, that is the Maine coast and the more wilderness areas of Maine. It was an area of the Northeast that was seen as the most wilderness filled, as the wild, wildest place still in the Northeast. And not only did these three artists, but also Child Hassam, who is in the exhibition, and Marsden Hartley, and many others, would go not only to, uh, would paint not only New York, uh, Hartley didn't, but he painted Berlin, but also go to Maine and make Maine their subject matter. And I have to also mention, of course, Lamar Dodd, who uh, not only painted the South, but painted New York, and then went to Manhegan, Maine, which a number of these artists did over and over again, and painted, and, uh, as well, and also, uh, if you know his work, he basically be tried to become the second John Marin. 
Now, all these artists owed their poetic and expressive vision of the rocky coast of Maine, which they played off the element of forces of New York City, to one of America's first modernist artists, along with Innocent Whistler, who I've mentioned. And particularly modernist in his use of materials again, in the uh, stuff of what is a painting to use it to express his immersion in the place. And that is Winslow Homer. Now, it may surprise you that Winslow Homer depicted New York City, but he did. And he did that early on as an illustrator for Harper's Weekly coming from Boston in 1859. And i um, showing you two of those illustrations here of New York. Uh, this is skating on Lady Skating Pond in Central Park. And uh, Whistle, uh, Winslow Homer kind of, is kind of makes a reference to himself here in some ways. Uh, this was in Harper's Weekly in 1860. And then uh, scenes he did of immigrant areas in New York, the Chinese in New York, seen inside of Baxter Street Clubhouse from 1874. Now these uh, scenes of New York City along with, of course, he would be embedded in the, with the troops in the Union troops in the Civil War and become very famous through that, but he would also paint many genre scenes. Uh, all this, these ideas of the activity of the city, of what is going on, of male and female encounters, of poor and rich, of Anglo-Saxons and immigrants, uh, would lead to a sense of both pleasure but also a kind of drama of human survival. Well, this he will take with him when he turns to the greatest subject of his life, and that is the world of the coast of Maine. He will go to Maine, uh, particularly Prout's Neck, in 1884. And he will stay there and paint it, though he'll also travel to many other places, including Bermuda, Florida, et cetera, uh, and also the Adirondack Mountains. But he will go there and uh, live till 1910 when he dies. And it will be the great subject of his life. Now, the etching we see on the bottom here, also in the exhibition, Perils of the Sea from 1888, was not actually inspired directly by a Prout's Neck scene, but it would be identified as such. It would be understood or seen as a response to, when it came out in 1888, to his new place of Prout's Neck. What it really is based on is a watercolor that Winslow Homer did in 1881. And to understand his response to, his modernist response to nature, uh, his visual poetics of Prout's Neck and Maine, we must first travel with him uh, to England, where he purposely went to find a new subject matter, a new tone in his art. He said he wanted a new atmosphere and color. He said he wanted new types of figures to represent. And there he did find new figures, not the fashion plate women who walked along the beaches of Long Branch, New Jersey, but instead the hardy fisherwomen of color coats, England. And uh, it was a small fishing town in Tymouth off of, and it's over here, off of Newcastle on Tyne. And here are some photographs from the time period of both the village and of the women. He spent a year and a half in this fishing village. And there he was inspired by the heroicism, particularly of these women. He now painted women, he would now paint women with a great heroic sense of purpose, but also again a, a deep connection to the environment and elements around them. He will be fascinated with those big elements of sky and sea and of poetry and danger and would carry those with him to Prout's Neck, Maine. As I have here this quotation, uh, when he saw them, he said that there are none like them in my country in dress, feature, or form. And he would, of course, find some like them when he would go to Prout's Neck and uh, make connections with the fisherwomen there and what he had seen in color coats. 
Now what he does is he draws upon his watercolors that he does in color coats as well as drawings. He didn't do any paintings there, any oil paintings. Uh, and then uh, would also inspire an etching like the one from 1888. What I want you to notice is some of the key changes that Winslow Homer did. Again, his ability to both see what, through careful observation, what's going on, but then to change it as an artist's imagination and artist's sensitivity to expression should do. And so, uh, first of all, of course, we have the reversal, because it's an etching, so it reverses. But notice how that creates a different effect. That instead of reading, as we normally do, in a very calm fashion from left to right, we now have these figures all looking to the left. And we're kind of taken a little bit uh, off. Uh, and there's a sense of a kind of startling quality to that. Also, he has gotten significantly rid of the fence here so that there is more of this immediacy with the waves and the sky. And a uh, kind of blending of the figures behind and the two women who kind of stand in for the whole community. And very significantly, I believe, is he gets rid of this immediate gesture. And this gesture that suggests that they've seen the person, the ship, whatever is lost, because many things got lost off the shores or were in danger in these very dangerous waters. And so instead, we have almost everyone waiting. We don't have a climax event. We are put, in fact, in the position of being like this community, of identifying with this community, and wondering, in a typical modernist fashion, what might happen next. There's an ambiguity. There's a sense of flux and change here uh, that is crucial. Now, Winslow Homer, as I said, will go to Prout's Neck, Maine. His family had property there. He would buy property. Uh, he would also have a studio built so that its door and porch faces uh, the ocean, and he would paint from that. He would also, of course, uh, spend do small sketches, but then uh, do these large canvases, like this painting from 1897, uh, a really imposing painting. Uh, 28 by 48 inches that used to be in the now Corcoran that's been enfolded into the National Gallery of Art. The light on the sea gives us what? Our fisherwomen, again, reconceived as now an American woman or any woman in facing nature, as it were, whether it's in England or Maine. But everyone saw these as paintings of Maine, which he intended. And he, he, that's why he was a successful uh, painter, because people had this wildness of Maine that they wanted to own and uh, look at. But I also love the sass that I see in this figure. Uh, in fact, you might notice she's got her arm akimbo. I kind of call her uh, the Mae West of the sea. I mean, it's almost like she's inviting us to come up and join her. Uh, you know, and there's something very uh, sexual here. And uh, Winslow Homer, like Walt Whitman, like uh, other modernists that I'll be mentioning, in particular George Bellows, really saw the sea, the ocean, as feminine, as, again, this kind of fertile uh, force and uh, as something that was constantly rejuvenating the earth, as women did. Uh, Winslow Homer, by the way, was a lifelong bachelor. He might have, in fact, had a, one of those uh, miserable love affairs early in his life and just didn't bother after that. Uh, who knows? Uh, that's for him to know and us to never know. Anyhow, uh, another thing that is important to understand Winslow Homer's modernism is the way this is painted. And notice uh, that the paint itself is very loose, uh, thick. Uh, we can still read the figures. It's not the way an Innes is. Uh, but it also is very adventurous in its coloring. And yes, this is not a, uh, a Photoshop slide. This is, in fact, really true to the color of the painting. And it reminds us that one of Winslow Homer's Bibles, that would be a Bible for the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists, was Chevreul's book, The Principles of Harmony and Contrast of Colors and Their Application to the Arts, which had an English edition in 1859. And what he admired about that book was how the, 
he spoke of how the human eye must see the world in relationship to all around it, to nature, how the eye takes in color according to the colors around it. What is happening uh, as you see at a particular point in time? Chevreul also emphasized the use of complementary colors. And as you look at this painting, uh, you'll see that he does give us quite audaci audaciously uh, this green with the red, complementary colors, and this lavender purple with this yellow here, again, complementary colors. And so Winslow Homer is much more modern uh, than you uh, may have uh, first thought. And I also love his brushwork, just one brush going across to convey uh, these waves in the ocean. Really quite extraordinary. And we see him over and over again uh, now turning, getting rid of even the figures, and turning to just the powers of nature. And he does that from the 1890s on. And the nor'easter here of 1895 is one of many of these paintings. This painting was actually uh, reworked um, in uh, 1899, taken from its owner who had in 1895, because originally there were two figures here. Winslow Homer got rid of those figures and instead enhanced, increased uh, the foam here so that it becomes just a kind of battle, as it were, of waves and cliff, darkness and light. Uh, we wonder what's going to happen to the weather, the fluidity and flux of nature's great elements. Now, two other books that were important to Winslow Homer, again, suggesting his more modernist mindset, was uh, George Chaplin Childs, the great architect, on um, the power, wisdom, and goodness of God as manifested in his works from 1866 and reprinted in 1871. And then Matthew Maury's great physical geography of the sea, which was a bestseller in America in 1855. Chaplin and Maury both praised the um, ideas of both God and nature, but not rejecting the new scientific theories of the likes of Darwin or the astronomers, or Maury himself. Chaplin, in particular, emphasized the role of the sea. The sea as pathless, trackless, and the world's mighty heart. And Maury, in his book, talked about, through the actual circulation of the waters, that through the globe, that God's presence can be felt that this dynamic universe, again, a modern universe now, not the universe of pre-Civil War America, this modern, very much in flux universe reflected uh, God, the great architect, as it were. And this is as religious as uh, Winslow Homer got, very much a kind of natural theology which many modernists would partake of. I have here a quotation uh, from Maury, who writes about the ocean and its movements as parts of the physical machinery that are expression of one thought, a unity with harmonies which one intelligence and one intelligence alone could utter. And here are some details, and you can see again how Winslow Homer uses the thickness of the paint to suggest this um, war, as it were, but also interchange, is a better word really, interchange between foam and sky, rocks and uh, sea. Here we have a real sense of the ferocity of the sea that Winslow Homer wanted to convey. Maury talked about how we never tire of the sea and, or the atmosphere, and then goes on, its powers are vast, multitudinous, and varied. Its adjustments and beauty and sublimity of effect vie with the glories of the heavens. And it seems to me that Winslow Homer is in part uh, both uh, connecting with the materiality, the very materiality of nature, but also its 
uh, patterns. It's a sense of uh, a Darwinian, very much a Darwinian fatalistic world. And here's a detail of this painting. You can see how thick the paint is, how he uses the palette knife, which is like a giant butter knife, uh, to convey that foam. But also take something, think about water, how transparent it is. Take something that is fluid and transparent and that would go through your hands, and make it solid, make it substantive, make it material, make it uh, Winslow Homer's paint. West Point Proud Snack from 1900 is an example of how Winslow Homer never tired of the sea and considered this, in fact, one of his finest paintings. Uh, he considered, uh, as I said, he considered this really an obs a combination of observation and abstraction, and it's certainly something that we can see here. It combines both sight and insight, and it is the sight and insight that is the essence of Winslow Homer's art, and I would assert that of all modernist visual poetics. In fact, in this work we have both poetry and danger, uh, these rocks that could in fact, or these waves that could in fact bring us under, and he did do a painting earlier in the 1880s of uh, the undertow. Yet at the same time, there is this incredible sense of the poetry of the sunset. And he insisted this was 15 minutes after sunset, not one minute before. And uh, he said, the sun has got beyond their clouds' immediate range, and they are in shadow. The light is from the sky in this picture. You can see that it took many days of careful observation to get this. And indeed, it is that careful observation. But it is also, of course, him using paint. And here is, again, a wonderful detail. Look at this brush stroke here, for example. This is almost like a little abstract expressionist uh, painting. But I also would like you to think of that wave as a reemergence of our May West of the sea, uh, that it creates, as not just myself, but other art historians have pointed out, a kind of torso, a kind of feminine life force, the elan vital, the life force that runs through all of nature and kind of giving us, again, this association of personalizing this painting and making us come face to face uh, with nature's powers. And here is a detail of this amazing sunset and, again, these brush strokes. This is Winslow Homer's last painting, Driftwood, from 1909. He had suffered a stroke in 1908, and this just enhanced the fatalism that he had really started portraying with these late seascape paintings, a sense again of the reality of nature's fluidity and life and then death. And we can see this single figure here as a kind of stand-in for Winslow Homer, a stand-in for ourself. It's very interesting, this large block, blockage of this um, a piece of wood that's gone across this giant uh, uh, piece of wood, uh, of uh, timber, and uh, the reminding us too that uh, actually stumps were used as gravestones in the 19th century, but also a sense of, of movement from the world of the material to then a much more spiritual world, that's world of the heavens that Maury and Chaplin had written about. And, uh, Notice that we have the bird above, just as we had that gull by our Lady of the Sea and Light on the Sea, as a kind of emblem of the soul, as birds so often were. So here, once again, we come to face to face through the materiality of paint with the sublimity of the sea and the realities of life and death. Well, these paintings by Winslow Homer were of enormous influence to George Bellows, Edward Hopper, and John Marin. George Bellows uh, would, in fact, uh, go to Maine in July 1911. And he would go to Mohegan Island, which is not far from Prout's Neck and had its own artist's circle. A small island, it's a mile and three quarters long and three quarters wide land mass. And it would, as I said, attract a number of fellow artists, including Lamar Dodd, who I mentioned earlier. This is one of four summer trips that George Bellows would make. 
he would go 1911, 1913, 14, 16, and then he would paint the sea again, but in California in 1917. Something I was surprised to learn that I didn't know was that George Bellows painted more than half of his output was of the sea. He did 550 uh, paintings and 275 of those were of the sea. Now many of them were small like these paintings are. These are all oil on board, 18 by 22 inches or so, would inspire larger oil on canvas paintings, but also were really seen as expressions themselves. And uh, here we have forth and back and also churn and break. And notice uh, he has picked up from what Winslow Homer was doing, but now is even more blending sky and water, rock and sea, and giving us, again, something very expressive, very abstract. Now, Bellows complained about the insidious female seductions of the sea. He said, too much sky, too much sea, too much cliffs. Of course, this was the first year he was married in 1911, and his wife could not come with him. He even said, beware of the native nymph of Monhegan, uh, as again, as if this great life force is going to eat him up. At the same time, he understood the key modernist sensibility, that a work of art can be any imaginable thing and that this is the beginning of modern painting. So that even though we have nature here, we also have really pure forces uh, and pure paint uh, in, uh, uh, visually attracting our eye. Now, while he was there in that first trip of 1911, he did these two paintings, Evening Swell and uh, The Island in the Sea a painting that he considered really his masterpiece, a real sure enough, he said to his wife, Emma. But I would also like you to consider that George Bella was a great painter of New York. He came to study with Robert Henry, the artist of the eight, uh, of course, knew John Sloan and others, and uh, painted much of the new modern New York that was happening, the teeming of the population, the new skyscrapers, and especially did a series of important canvases, recognized by the critics of the day as important, of the Pennsylvania Street uh, station being excavated, that is the Penn Underground Rail Station, the original one, not the horrible one we have today. And uh, notice here in this painting from, 30, uh, from 1909, we have this kind of uh, the uh, landscape of New York, very mountainous, not unlike the mountain of Mohegan here, island. Uh, the waves and the uh, water here, not unlike the snow and the unearthing. And that there's this real sense of uh, work that being done, heroicism being done. In fact, they equated the actual excavation as like the excavating of Her Herculaneum. He did many of these paintings. Uh, here are two more of the Pennsylvania excavation from 1907 and 1908, one at night. And the way he uses the paint and the palette knife to create this truly thick material uh, canvas that speaks to the visceral violence that's being done to the earth and nature is something that we also see in his uh, main paintings like Gorge and Sea in which he is experimenting both with color like he is here, here's some bright reds, and also a kind of almost claustrophobic landscape. So again, very modernist in its sensibility. Summer Surf is up here on the top left. Uh, from uh, 1914. Uh, now his wife has been joining him. This is the final summer in Mohegan. Uh, but this leads us to another artist who you may be very surprised painted the other three works. They might look a lot like a bellows, especially this one. Uh, these even have a kind of Homer-esque like quality except for the brighter color palette. These are by Edward Hopper. And Edward Hopper uh, went to Maine uh, for the first time uh, after he returned from Paris, uh, was in Paris 
uh, and returns permanently to New York in 1910. And he travels to Maine in 1914 uh, to an area near Prout's Neck, Argonquant, Maine. And uh, there he was inspired by his friend George Bellows and also their mutual friend Leon Kroll, as well as Robert Henry. And this was, believe it or not, Edward Hopper's first engagement with painting wilderness nature. He hadn't really done that. He had, of course, painted what he saw in Europe, and then he was starting to engage with the buildings and cities, the life of New York. Uh, but now he paints, oops, excuse me, he paints uh, the world of sea and sky and does it in small oil on wood. And again, some of these are quite small. But then he'll do larger paintings on canvas. This is 24 by 29 inches. The rest are like 9 by 13. And he'll carry them around. But what I want you to notice is how restrained the sea is and the sky is. That what Edward Hopper, and knowing his work as some of you do, this may not surprise you, what Edward Hopper seems most interested in is the architectonics of the shore, the architectonics of the cliffs, and treating them not unlike he would treat a piece of architecture, but yet again using a more free use of paint. He would return uh, to uh, the, um, to Maine in 1929 after painting, going there till uh, 1919. He'll return uh, in 1926 and 1927 and 1929, but now move to the city, particularly to Portland and its ancient architecture, it's, or, or I should say 19th century architecture, and also to Cape Elizabeth, where the great lighthouses were. And he would start painting these lighthouses, and I show you two of them at the top here. His uh, Lighthouse Hill, which is Captain Upton's house. Again, you can see this today if you actually go to Cape Elizabeth off the coast of uh, near Prout's Neck, and Lighthouse at Two Lights. And uh, what he gives us are these kind of very forceful objects of the lighthouse. He, of course, again, gives us a expressive way of painting despite his reticence, his uh, very arch architectonic and silent sense of silence, not the vast emotion we have in a bellows or a homer. And they also might remind you very much of the kind of uh, quietude and silence and a loneliness even of his New York City scenes. And these are from a year later, Mountain Bridge Loop, Manhattan Bridge Loop of 1928, and from Williamsburg Bridge from 1928. Hopper insisted, however, in a very modernist way, that not only did he look carefully to paint his impressions, but that a great art was indeed the outward expression of an inner life in the artist. And this inner life will result in his personal vision of the world. Well, his wife, Jo, who he married, by the way, right before they went uh, to Maine, um, that first time in 1914, uh, said that these lighthouses, in their silence, in their objecthood, one might even say in their phallic male nature, were to her self-portraits uh, by uh, Hopper. And uh, there is this uh, very um, uh, kind of strong, and he was a very difficult man apparently to live with, um, very strong quality to them, but also again something kind of forbidding even in their forms, just as the New York landscape was. <clears throat> but the modernist artist who most learned from Homer and I would even say Innes, and who most took from New York those vital energies and found correspondences to them when he went to Maine was the great artist John Marin. Marin, who would also never tire of painting the sea like Edward, uh, excuse me, like Winslow Homer. He, in fact, uh, would paint over 40 years of his life in Maine and of the sea, just as he would return to New York City over and over again. John Marin was New York, was New Jersey born, and uh, 1905, like 
opera had done a little few years later, goes to Paris and travels throughout Europe, but comes and insists he's now going to paint only America in 1911, and he settles in New York City. In 1912, he marries for the first and only time at the age of 42. And it is at that time that he becomes one with the energies of New York. But not far after that time, he takes, two years later, he'll take his pregnant wife, Marie, uh, to Maine. Here we have two of the elements of New York City that Marin was a master at painting and capturing the forces. Brooklyn Bridge, he did many etchings as well as watercolors, and, and Marin is like Winslow Homer, John Singer Sargent, our great watercolorist. And uh, he also loved the skyscrapers, all the people, you might notice there are cars here, these are the teeming people. Uh, even, I love this clock, which seems as if it's about to topple over because something's gonna change at any moment. Uh, this is actually a top, a light on top of a skyscraper, but it looks like a sun or a comet. We have here all the energies of New York, and he painted these over and over again. Woolworth Building, he did a whole series of both etchings, making it literally dance, and he called it Dancing Woolworth Building, uh, as well as doing that with the Brooklyn Bridge. For John Marin, the essence of New York and also, as we'll see, Maine, were forces at work. And he said that, uh, I see great forces at work, and that great movements, the large buildings and the small, influences of one mass and another greater or smaller mass. Feelings are roused which give me the great desire to express the reaction of these pull forces. And he goes on and he says, while these powers are at work, pushing, pulling, sideways, downwards, upwards, I can hear the sound of their strife and there is great music being played. And so I try to express graphically what a great city is doing. Marin actually was almost a concert pianist, and he owned a Steinway piano. He constantly made references to his art and music, just as Innes had done, just as Whistler had done, and just as many modern artists in the 20th century would also do. He also gives us a sense of not only modernist forces of technology, but also life forces of the people and all of their energies uh, really taking over, or what Henri Bergson would call the Elan Vital, great philosopher, French philosopher who influenced these artists. Well, as I said, in 1914, he goes to Maine for the first time and is so taken with it. In fact, he said, Maine grabbed him by the nape of the neck. Once I get here, I forget other places. And as I said, he will paint it for 40 years. Well, when he gets there, he is so taken with it, not only does he paint it, but he buys a small island. There are lots of islands in Maine, you can buy your own. And it has no water, uh, so there's no house there, but he also bought a boat, and he would repeatedly go to this island. Well, one of the things that captured his attention on that island, just as the lighthouses became an important image for Hopper, or the waves and cliffs of Monhegan Island became so important for Bellows, was the pine trees. The pine trees, which, uh, of course, take on a very dramatic change. They might remind you, in fact, of that wonderful uh, Gustav Bauman uh, cypress pine, cypress tree, I should say, from California that he did in the show, but the same sense of how nature alters it. And he painted these pine trees over and over again. Tree and Sea, 1919. Little Tree, May, 1914. Pine Tree, Small Point, May, 1926. Uh, and then another one here. Over and over again. And he said about the pine tree, that they were beautiful in their lonesomeness, that they were solemn, restful, beautiful furs. He saw them as symbolic survivors. And yes, I think again, we can see them as types of self-portraits for Marin. Again, the subjectivity, just as Innes saw that heron as a kind of stand-in for his soul. 
Marin, of course, is much more modern in his uh, use of form than any of the artists I've shown you. And uh, he gives us these large, dramatic lines of force, these big forces that he saw pulling left and right. This is Maine Islands from 1922. He read Einstein, was very interested in Einstein's theories, in particular that there were an infinite number of spaces which are in motion with respect to each other, that constantly things were moving one against the other. And if you look carefully at this, you might notice some pictographic forms here, ones that even suggest an infinity. Or is that an eight? Is this a seven? And then I love this, we have like a little whale fish smiling at us. Uh, he would have this kind of playfulness, but are these then a clock's hands? Or is this again something even more abstract, this notion of uh, space and time that is constantly shifting uh, as he uh, looks at and studies the main landscape. Marin wrote, you try to see your objects in their movement positions. You seek for backbones of these swaying objects. These you must hold to for all you are worth. And he said that all good writing, all good painting, all good music obeys this principle. In fact, he called it the backbone principle. And he called his paintings movements in paint. And then he said, though I'm using objects, I am representing paint first of all and not the motif primarily. Now really interestingly, just as Innes used his fingers in his painting, so did Marin in his watercolors. He would actually paint with both hands at the same time uh, and sometimes with two brushes. And he did this not only in his main scenes but as you can see here in Lower Manhattan. And this also is a lot like that wonderful drawing in the exhibition of the Lower bat Battery. I love too how he plays with the horse here, the old days as we have now the Woolworth building, other buildings coming up. And is this and maybe even a reference to Brooklyn Bridge, to all the spires and girders, but also to the abstract forces of energy that he senses in this place that he is now really placed in his own uh, self that he has intuited. In, in his Manhattan from 1921, in this watercolor, he now gives us a framing around the scene. And I think in many ways he intends these two works to be what we call pendants, that is, uh, works to be seen together. We have that world of the energies of New York, and we have that world of the energies of nature in Maine. And we also have nationalistic Maine, red, white, and blue. He said, by the way, that one should paint water so it follows the flow of one's hands. And yet at the same time, he said, I find myself constantly juggling with things, playing one thing against another. And then when I get through, they look so much alike. Marin, they act like Marin. Can I not ever get away from this fellow Marin? And here we have that absolute modern sensibility of subjectivity, of topophilia, of a sense of place of the visual poetics of place, that one becomes what one paints, but also what one paints becomes oneself, takes on the qualities of oneself. And I want to finish by giving you a hint of how Marin continues this also in oil, and also saw his works as a whole. Uh, those frames that I showed you with the pine tree were all designed by Marin, as were these frames here. And once again, he continues to paint the Hudson River uh, and New York from the Hudson River and the cruise ship, and also the fog lifts in Maine. And look at how abstract this work is from 1949, giving us this rectilinear concept of fog and its heaviness. But these frames were all designed by Marin. It is a whole, that sense of everything being unified a very modernist sensibility, one that Innes understood. Marin said if he could plan out work, he would. Uh, he would like to do that very much. Uh, he said, but I find that this wayward temper of mine will not allow me to. I find things cropping up I never intentionally intended. You can transpose, you can play with and on your material, but when you are finished, 
that got to have the roots of that thing in it and an inner vision of your own has got to be transposed onto your medium. And so we return to George Ennis's home of the heron and see that indeed these two artists as well as Bellows and Hopper and Homer all were attuned to their medium as a true modernist would be, to the possibilities of a visual music, to the forces of work, and most of all, to the inner vision of experience. And that we have here the true visual poetics of place. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, sorry. Man out a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> mm. Happy to answer any questions or field any comments or any thoughts. You might have noticed something that I've never seen before. Always learning. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Turner was very important precedent for many of these artists. You know, Turner always reminds us when we see his late works too how far ahead he was. But talk about the true modernist. And um, obviously, when my love of modernism began actually with Turner's work and then uh, moved on to these American artists. But yeah, Turner, very important. And actually, Turner was important for another. Um, uh, artist who of the late 19th century who starts playing a little bit. I wouldn't call him modernist because he's still really gr gr grounded in Hudson River School. But Thomas Moran might be aware of. And I, yeah. Tonalism and luminism. Oh, don't ask me that question. <laughs> My dissertation is all about luminism. Um, <laughs> um, uh, tonalism actually was a term used in the late 19th century. I, it was used, um, tonalism, for those who don't know the term, was often applied to the art of Ennis. Uh, this is a very good example of it, of Whistler, and also to photography. As some of you know, uh, the soft, out of focus photography of Edward Steichen's early work. Uh, actually, Stieglitz's work to some degree. Uh, Fred Holland Day. Uh, those are uh, so-called tonalist works, and it really is the sense of not the high contrast that we see in Bellows' landscapes of Maine, for example, but this gradation, the soft gradation. And it is, but what is key to tonalism was again this notion that art is not to be a lesson, but to convey a mood, uh, to in fact be poetic, to you to be taken with it by emotion first, and then maybe notice the few forms in it. So really to create a sensibility. It's really a sensibility. Luminism is a whole other subject I'm not going to touch. Uh, let me just say that luminism comes out of the, it is part of the Hudson River School. It comes out of my, my particular theory is it comes out of the criticism of the 1850s in which breath and light and form are important, but the word luminism is never used. That was given by art historians in the, 18, in the 1950s, Barbara Novak in particular, and John Barr. Would Innes be considered a, a, a tonalist? Yes, Innes, I would consider Innes, late Innes, especially a tonalist, absolutely. He, he was often uh, called an impressionist. Yeah, no, 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 no. And, then, and I get very upset when people call Homer impressionist. No, no, no. Uh, Twachman's not even an impressionist. He's a tonalist as well. I mean, he has an impressionist face. But it's not that, there's not that sense of the bright palette. Child has him as an impressionist. Okay, he is the true American impressionist. And if you play his bright palette and broken brushwork next to the softness and evocativeness of an Ennis, you see quite a difference. Plus even subject matter. There's a need for leisure, modern life, and the Impressionist work. Or these artist works like Ennis, Twachman, uh, Whistler are poetic and in several cases very spiritual. Yeah, more like, say, late Corot or... Yes, exactly, and they're very much influenced by the Barbizon artists, yeah. Those two late... Um, Narratives out there with all the white, I, I can't help but contrast them with, say, Mondrian's Broadway book. Yes, I love that. You know, with all the rectilinear yes. forms. But if that one, if Mondrian was supposed to show the energy of the city, it's so 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I'm an American, as I think the Americans are better, but no, not really. But um, uh, what's interesting is that Marin was an architect, trained as an architect, mm -hmm. and as you probably know, Dennis, and uh, so that we have that kind of quality. But you're right, there really is that. And I always think of Marin's images of New York City, I mean, you just feel like the whole thing's about to explode, you know, all these energies, and that these inner grids here, this frame, is barely keeping everything contained. You know. Anything else? Yeah, Emily. Thank you so much for your talk. Oh, thank you. A uh, uh, concept of what? I'm sorry, topophilia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, intersubjectivity in terms of the the community itself. Yeah. And how and have reception, right. Um, you know, that's a really important point because I think about how and you particularly the modernist works, I assume is um, because that's one thing that's interesting. Church and the Hudson River School had a kind of, it was a, a kind of nationalist language that they're working with. And now we have this much more personal language, particularly in the elements of paint and each artist's style as so much marking. I mean, you can't, except for when Lamar Dodd's trying to be John Mayer, and you can't really see another, I'm giving him a hard time, I shouldn't. Um, uh, he was a nice man. Uh, that you have this sense of, uh, this is a Marin, this is a Hopper, this is whatever. Um, yet at the same time, they are part of their time and part of the how others are responding to the city, how others are responding to Maine. Uh, they also have a kind of shared literature. Thoreau was very important to Hopper, believe it or not. Uh, and Thoreau, who of course is the great writer of the Maine woods, you know, I think there's some of that. And I think about it, this just made me think of Hopper's kind of weird woods, woods side scenes that he does, even with his um, New York scenes and suburban scenes, you have that and, and the power of the woods in uh, Thoreau's writings. So I, I would say, I think what it is, is there's those moments when they connect, and then there's moments when the artist is, so what, you know, it's like, this is my personal statement. And that's part of the difficulty of modernism, isn't it, uh, often? Uh, and became even more problematic when you have artists like Kandinsky, who will say, I am going to give you a language, and everybody should be able of color and form, and everybody should be able to get out of that. And of course, it doesn't unless you read his book. And even then, you still don't get it. You know, it, you, and then you start hunting and finding out he has his own iconography and all this stuff. So yeah, there, I think that's always been the tension between the public and modernist art. Uh, though, however, I think Americans, American modernists, in their insistence on being and painting the American thing and American subject matter, were able to then have a hook. Not that these, some of these works weren't seen as radical, they were, Amarins in particular. Uh, you, I know, Emily know, but other people, he showed his Woolworth buildings, uh, ones that aren't too different from uh, this one here. In fact, this one might have been also been in the Armory Show, in the Armory Show of 1913, and they were really, of the American works, the most radical works in the show. And not as radical as what the Europeans are doing, like Duchamp, but still, and uh, people just didn't get all those um, strange blocks. You know, what's all that block doing? Katie, I think you have. Yes! Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yes, yes, and Pollock who said, uh, you know, I don't paint nature, I am nature. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good point. Anything else? It's been a long day. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Of course, please join us outside. I'll be happy to talk to you. Cafe is open.